Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Goodness, that's loud. Um, so uh, we are here today to hear Jean Slick talk to us about painting as a research method, phenomenological approach. And uh, I wanted us to take a moment in this beautiful sunny day and acknowledge the ancestral lands of the Kasapsum and Lekwungen people and just take a minute to think about how lucky we are to live, learn and work here. So this event is sponsored by the Tri-Agency Research Support Fund and um, no, I have nothing else to say. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Jean. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about painting as a research method. I'm going to give some context for my overall research and then do a deeper dive into the painting as a research method. So the first part of this presentation will just sort of situate where my research is and how I came at it. And then I will give you more detail about the painting as the research method as we move on. So this started off for me as an exploratory study. I have an undergraduate degree in fine arts. I was a printmaker originally. Um, many years later in my life, I started painting. And the images I started painting were of fire skies, like wildfire, because I had a place in southern Alberta that was on evacuation alert because of the Lost Creek fire. So I had some beautiful image. I'm struck by the beauty of wildfire. So I was looking at how to integrate painting into my research. My research interests are in how technology is influencing what we call the emergent characteristics of disaster response. The DEM students who are here will know what that means, but emergent response is just the way that people naturally use whatever talents, abilities, or assets they have to help others. We know that behavior in disaster context is mostly pro-social. Remember that for the COVID scenario. Um, and so in particular, trying to marry this idea of, of my background in the arts and thinking about painting, I'm interested in the visual dimensions of uh, social media as being uh, generated and circulated. And I'm interested in what citizens do as opposed to what the media or others do with that. So that led to a few questions. So what, um, and the piece on phenomenology came in because I, to, to help me figure this out, I took some painting classes and the painting instructors, as I told them who I was, suggested I do some reading about Merleau-Ponty's work, phenomenology of perception, um, aesthetics and phenomenology. So I started to look at that material. And a phenomenological approach focuses on description rather than explanation. So it seemed well suited to the work that I was doing. So I first needed to explore what would a phenomenological approach to visual research methods be. And phenomenology also looks at what's the essence of something. So what's the essence of the experience of being an eMERGE room doctor or an eMERGE room nurse? What's the essence of the experience of being a researcher? Uh, so we want to look at the essence of experience. So I'm wanting to look at what the essence of the experiences are that are portrayed in the YouTube videos. And then I want to think about how to represent it, that in a series of acrylic paintings. So I'm still finishing the painting series. It's been an interesting journey and I'll take you on that journey as I move through the presentation. So to situate my research, the study of social media and disasters is um, a field called crisis informatics, which is a subfield of social informatics, which looks at the social dimensions of information um, and computing technologies. Within crisis, or crisis informatics research, though, there's a bias in there. And most of the research is based on Twitter. And the reason is, is that the search mechanisms for different social media use different API, and the API in Twitter are friendly for researchers, whereas the API in YouTube are a bit more challenging. Um, and so what this has led to is the use of advanced computational methods to study social media in disaster context. <clears throat> and there is some very limited study of visual social media data. And when that happens, it starts actually with uh, human analysis. And so it's machine learning then that takes place. So you need some initial coding by individuals. And then some machine learning from there will expedite it. Um, there is, I'm going to say, limited to no uh, study of video in social media in the disaster context. So this space that I'm looking at a video is just not there. So in order to situate my research in relation to crisis informatics research, 
I'd say about, it was actually only as I really got into writing the findings, because I produced a traditional academic article based on my analysis of some videos of the Fort McMurray fire, um, the feedback I got from a peer reviewer was I needed to do some things to, they asked some question, particular questions about things I was saying about forms of witnessing. And so I had to really delve more into the literature on that. And so I've really added this second dimension to fit it in there, which is really looking at social technical dimensions of the, um, of the videos themselves. And so I have a set of questions. And these questions really guide my work over now a number of different uh, disasters that I've been studying. It started with the Fort McMurray fire, but I'm, I'll show you later what I'm, my more recent research is about. So in terms of research methods, there were also gaps. There was a lack of a phenomenological approach to looking at visual methods. Most of the visual methods, at least within fields of things like sociology and anthropology, use ethnographic approaches, which are very different than phenomenological approaches. So phenomenological approaches, um, when they talk about methods, the methods that are described are all based on textual data, even though phenomenology really also deals with phenomenology of perception, and there's a lot written about painting and aesthetics in there. And the visual methodology acknowledges phenomenological approaches, but then describes ethnographic approaches. So there's this gap in what that is. So I had to figure out how, what to do. So this visual I've shown before, but it's changed over time. It comes from Paul's work about a visual methodology. So you can talk about visual in terms of the origin and nature of the visuals, the research focus and design, and then the format and purpose. So I'm starting with pre-existing visual artifacts, which are YouTube videos, and I'm focusing on the visual content. It, I have also started to focus on the visual and verbal content. I am not looking at things like the comments that people make. I'm not interested in that. Um, I started off looking at phenomenology, but I needed to bring in, to answer the questions about socio-technical dimensions, I needed to bring in critical visual methodology. So I draw from both of those. And I had originally been describing painting as a research method, and what I would now do is I would say painting is both um, a method, that's the verb, the action of painting, and it's also an output format when we think about the painting itself as a noun. And so, um, both of those are tied into the methods. So I needed to adapt and I've created a, uh, an approach now for using visual phenomenological uh, methods. So I take descriptive phenomenology, phenomenological methods and which looks at epoch or setting aside your preconceived notion of the idea. So if I'm looking at fire evacuation scenes, I stop thinking about what I know from my own experience or from what I've read in the literature, and I'm just starting to come at this as if it's a new experience. So I watch that video time and time and time again, each time looking for what else can I see in here that I've not seen before. And then there is uh, an approach to reducing it down. And so um, what you see there on the left-hand side it, on the screen, I've created a template. I've got a timestamp. I do... Um, put in the narrative comments that are there, and then I show what the image is when the narrative comment is there. If you actually want to correlate the two, you actually need to look at the image just before the comment is made, so when somebody says, holy shit, you need to look at what happened that caused them to say that. Um, and then um, the evocative methods from an, an approach are really looking at the way that you give voice to your findings. And so I'm giving voice to my findings, both um, verbally in writing, and um, visually. Um, so I've really learned through this process that it's both a visual and verbal endeavor. I don't use my regular notebook when I do this work. I use my sketchbook, but in there I have pictures and I also have um, words. And so I think through, so my thinking through the words that, that are associated with this project came from that kind of uh, writing and thinking. And so there's different affordances. I think it's really important to have both, the written and the visual, and I will continue to produce findings in both ways. So in terms of critical visual methodology, just so you know what that piece looks at, I draw from Rose's work, and she looks at three dimensions of analysis across four elements, so technological, compositional, and social. 
looking at the site of production, the image, the circulation, and the audiencing. So I can situate and frame, I'm not going to go through all the detail, just to say uh, this as part of developing the overall methodology for this work, it draws on phenomenology as well as this critical visual um, methodology. So from that work on the 2016 Fort McMurray fires, um, what I found was that there were three different types of experiences that were portrayed in videos. Watching the approach of the fire, fleeing through the fire, or watching your house burn. Watching your house burn had uh, two subcategories. One was watching from the inside and one was watching from the outside. In terms of socio-technical practices, I found the use of uh, cell phones, dash cams, doorbell cams, and house cams. And I found that the technologies were an influence on the site of production and the image characteristics, the length and the number of videos. I found that the effects of the recording uh, technologies reflected different forms of witnessing. And I draw on Peter's work here, which draws on the traditions of witnessing in religion or law and broader um, witnessing in society. And in particular, um, home security cameras. So a Nest Cam on your wall or a doorbell cam. Um, create a situation in which you now have different ways of seeing what's happening in a disaster context than you would have otherwise. And normally you describe witnessing as either first-hand or second-hand. And so when the person who takes the video as they're fleeing through the fire, that's when they see it, it's the first-hand. When you see the video, it's the second-hand. So in my first draft of the article that I wrote, I talked about um, the home security cameras and talked about those as being first person accounts. And I was challenged by that. So I ha it was actually the literature on witnessing that helped me to sort this out. And so it's really about presence in time, presence or absence in time and space. And so what's interesting with home security cameras is you the per it's still a very personal view. So Leslie, if you have a home security camera, you're the first person who will see that. You may see it in real time or not in real time, and then you may choose to share it. That is still an intensely personal view, because if it's of your home burning, it's, it's your point of view of the world, and it's what you've positioned the camera in your home. And so it brings in a different type of mediated witnessing that is actually really not accounted for in existing typologies on witnessing today. So there's some fascinating things like that that came out of this study. Um, the other piece is that uh, the wildfires uh, videos are really um, an integration of two types of convergence, which have been studied since the 50s in the disaster management field. So we're looking at informational and social convergence. And so there are seven types, DEM students as we know, seven types of behaviors that we can talk about um, of convergent behaviors. And so what I'm suggesting is that witnessing is actually an eighth type of behavior um, and is distinctly different from the other seven behaviors. So now on to the painting part. So it, this is about giving form to thought in different ways. So as I said, the article that I did, it was actually published last year on April 1st. So the writing can precede the painting. And if I was to write the article today, I would add things to it because the experience of painting has taught me things. But the article was not about the painting process. I mentioned that it's a two-part study. Uh, it's really about... Um, both the visual and uh, techno-social analysis of the videos. So now I want to take you through sort of the journey of the painting process and what that's been like. So that is um, one of my paintings, not the first, but one of my, uh, it's the first in the series that I did. Um, and so I want to just explain a bit about the development of paintings. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is have you all join in something called a cold critique. The DEM students learned about this last year. So the idea is you have to all stand up. You have to come around and form a sort of semicircle around these paintings up here. And then I'm just going to ask you to comment. This is a stand. You have to move. I know we want to social distance. Just don't touch people or cough on them. But it's OK. We're in a low risk setting. So in a cold critique, an artist gets feedback on their work. And people comment on it. Um, 
And so I don't answer questions. So this is a chance for you to just comment, make observations, show what your musings or thinking are, and offer your reaction to these paintings. I really like the dynamic aspects of it. And I'm sure that's what that is with the headlights and with the trees <coughs> askew. It really has a sense of motion and immediacy. And I loved it as soon as I walked in the door. I could see that. I find them emotional, raw, mm -hmm. scary, yeah. frightening. For me, it actually reminds me of stories that I heard from people who experienced this firsthand and talking about driving, um, thinking they were going the wrong way because there was fire on both sides and they couldn't actually see the road. And um, their description to me was it was literally driving through hell. I feel really, really uncomfortable and uneasy looking at them, but in a really good way because it conveys that there's real emotion that people would have been feeling in that moment that the painting has been able to portray in a way that I can now feel a sense of that too. The word that comes to mind for me is terror or terrifying. And it, because I'm terrified of fire, but it just sort of brings home the idea that there's a different meaning to the word terror. It doesn't mean that someone's trying to kill you. It can be something as natural and horrifying as a fire. It's also beautiful. It's beautiful. I love the way you see the beauty of the fire. I find that the one on the bottom is particularly interesting because that car is going towards the fire, if I believe. We're, we're seeing it from the back, so it kind of gets you thinking as to why there, why not the other way. I actually hear the painting more than I see it. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm like overwhelmed with this, like a, a sense of what that that scene sounds like. Um, and there's something about the one on the bottom that feels more out of control mm -hmm. than the one on the top. I like the one on the bottom, and what I like about it is, is that it, uh, a lot of the detail is obscured in the flame and smoke, and that's, I see a lot of this. And that's more of what I see. Things aren't very clear um, in some cases. And I like how that one just sort of, it's sort of showing that by, by a lot of it just being more blocked up with like that, that contrast between the dark of the smoke and the light of, uh, of the light of what's coming out of the fire. We're just doing a cold critique for those of you who came in. We'll, we'll sit down in a second so you can join. Can we talk about that one too? Uh, yeah. <laughs> For me, what I see is, it scares me a little bit, is I actually see life in those paintings. And so as I was listening to everybody else talk about how they're perceiving it, I really started to grapple with the way I saw it. I didn't see it in a way, in a negative way at all. I saw it as life because of the bright colors and the beautiful, I think, contrast of the lights in there. Um, and, and so I'm grappling with the disconnect of the reality of that and the portrayal of that reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it just points out to me the beauty of destruction um, can be in a way dangerous, right? It can be, um, what's the word? mesmerizing. I don't know if that's how people felt as they were going through it, but yeah, I could get lost in that. Okay, so thank you. I'll have you sit down. You've got to experience a cold critique with art, so that's part of what I wanted you to experience. And so what kind of things did you hear when people were talking? What, what, what does that tell you about painting? Subjective. Subjective. Evocative. Evocative. Emotional. Emotional. <coughs> so painting does some things for us in a different way. And I'm not sure that if you read my article, you would have that same commentary. <laughs> and so I think one of the things for me is that there, there really are different ways of presenting um, findings from research. And that 
the paintings themselves have an ability to be used in a different way and reach a different audience. And I'll talk a bit more about that. Leslie, you wanted to talk about the image that was up there. What did you want to say about that? Well, I find that image really interesting because there's a sense of calm in the sort of soft focus and yet the contrast between the calm feeling of the photograph and the horrific destruction <coughs> that's taking place in it. I find that really, really interesting. I mean, I find this spectacularly beautiful. This sends a different kind of message to me. So there are, as I mentioned, if we go back, there are these different types of experiences. And so I started by painting Fleeing Through Fire, and I started with the dash cam series. So I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to move on to talking about um, how as I've moved through the pain process of painting, so the act of painting, how the paintings have changed. Um, maybe I'll, I've got a slide that just talk, uh, I'll just, since it's here. So as a result of doing this work, my, my worry was how can I legitimize my painting as a research method and the work that I do? Because I'm not sure about that. I've now gone to International Visual Sociology Association, American and Canadian, Visual Anthropology Association meetings. And I do fit in those places, but I'm an outsider because I use painting. People use film and um, photography as traditional visual methods in ethnography. And so I'm outside of that. Um, but I've learned a lot from those conferences. And what I can say is I've now, through this work, I've extended. So moving beyond just this whole thing about emergent response to disasters, I uh, can now situate my work within crisis informatics research, and I can also situate it within crisis journalism. Social, uh, social uh, informatics and crisis informatics, the intention is to sort of look at that human social dimension of computing. And so the strength of that body of literature is related to that strength of, I'm going to say, those other disciplinary perspectives that you bring in to look at this. And and so the people who've been leading crisis informatic research are people who have the computational abilities, not people who have the disaster management. And so they're getting closer to bringing that part of their writing and interpretation to be stronger, but it's missing. And so I think one of the things, strengths I bring as a scholar is being able to actually bring and integrate these three distinct different uh, fields of study into this project. I find that the photography is a much more distance and immediate. Your mm. painting is so immediate and so involving and so gripping emotionally. The photographs have a much greater distance to them. Mm. So I think you're really onto something. <laughs> well, what I'm interested in is being able to take something into a public space, yeah. right? And to have a different audience. I'm also interested in painting. I love painting, right? And so where do I go and how do I make myself a person who's not painting on a weekend and doing something else in the middle of the week. How do I make myself whole at this stage and age in my life? So here's some work about painting as a research method. This, I came across this quite early. And so I've been thinking of painting as idea, painting as form, and painting as act. So painting as act will be when I get it in the gallery and I do a focus group, which for me would begin with a cold critique of the paintings and then a discussion and then a Q&A. And so there's an order to that. I get your, I get people's feedback, then I tell, and then I get questions. And so that's a process that I think would be help for me to validate some of the, what the public, the use of this in the public sphere would show. So I showed you a previous graphic where I had sort of, you know, like the timestamp and then the voice and then the images and then I had some narrative description um, there and I'm looking for uh, structural and textural changes that are occurring. So as I moved to the paintings though, I took that work and then had to kind of further reduce it. It's, so it's a further reduction. And in this process of reduction, I was trying to, to look, one of the things that you look at in phenomenological approaches is to look at transitions. And so what I was looking for is transitions within an experience. So what, is the ex what are the transitions within the experience of fleeing through fire? And it was actually the study of the images that gave me that, because I started off thinking about evacuation. And the word evacuation and fleeing through fire are like two totally different concepts. So looking at this, you get to the visceral piece of fleeing through fire, right? 
So what, I, and these are not all of them, but what I did is I created little mini images and I would cut them out and move them around and put them on boards and um, that would allow me to start to visualize what the series would be for the dash cam. And as I paint, I sometimes will further change what the series will look like and I'll talk about that in a different one. So. The, this is an earlier version of the painting that you just saw on the screen. So this is a beginning sort of underlay for what I began with. When you think about painting as form, um, within the um, visual art field, uh, so if you're doing regular research, I can go back and I can show all those citations about how my work connects to others. When I go into this process, as I've been, I've been doing painting classes and then taking some directed studies. And so one of the things is to look at, just as you would look at how your work fits within other research, you look at how your painting fits within other painters and you study other painters. So that is a picture of Turner. He did fire. I'm looking at other people who do fire and sky. So Turner is one. Uh, so one of, one of my studies that was an, like a precursor to this project was to paint a Fort McMurray fire scene in the style of Turner, right? To try and think about what that would be. The other thing I had to think about in terms of painting as form was that I use video color. I want it to look like video. And so I actually had to go back and take a color painting class again to remind myself about how to mix paint, which is different than mixing other kinds of color. And um, so I worked uh, to, with the instructor to identify three colors. And so all of my paintings, regardless of what they look like, have the same three colors plus white. Anything that looks black, I've had to make. And so these are color, this is an additive process where you add the colors together. And so then it, add, you can make anything out of three colors. So, but the particular three colors that I use need to work to create video color. So now I'm going to just show you sort of what that process is like. So this is the first one in the dash cam series. So there were six videos, three front and three rear, three minutes each. And so what I was really dealing with on the painting as idea side was um, this idea, the essence of fleeing through fire. What, that what does it feel like to move through fire? But it's about movement through space and movement through time. So I'm going to just show you from the front part of the series some examples. So the image that you see, so none of my images that you see in painting are actually of a still from the video. video. They are composites from multiple stills. So I create images that did not exist, right? So it looks like something that happened, but it didn't happen. So in this one, I wanted to choose the um, truck being very close because throughout the video it's like this stop and go and you just can't move ahead because there's a tr somebody in, a, a, in front of you. So I wanted to bring that piece that I had seen in the video itself. But I also wanted to deal with the proximity of the fire. And so the proximity of the fire in the image that had the truck close wasn't what I wanted. So I needed to fuse these. So it's a process of fusing. In, these paintings, my process of fusing is based on doing prints. So I print out color photographs and then I um, print them in sort of this kind of size and then I put them up. And so I'm visually fusing it as I'm doing it. Um, I have in some instances used a projector, but that came later. The initial stuff, it's just like, I just have to do it. I just have to fuse it is all I can say. So it's, it's, that's the act of painting. So, and that's part of the research piece. How do you do that? This is one of the experiences was that you were really traveling and it became night and there were sparks raining down around everyone. Um, I will change this painting and I will change it based on feedback that I got at the International or the Visual Sociology Association Conference. I edited out a bunch of cars and I've got the truck up close again because that was a really constant feature in the video. But there is a section of cars that come in on the left from a neighborhood, and I didn't put it because the, the particular, one of the particular scenes, I didn't like the shape of the vehicle. There is a piece about the aesthetic dimension of this. 
Um, and that was reinforced to me at the, both the visual sociology and anthropology conferences because they will critique each other's work based on the aesthetics of their photograph or video. So the same holds true here. So I need to put some more vehicles in there because it's not conveying enough of the congestion of the traffic. Mm -hmm. But that's where for me this process of showing and getting feedback contributes to my understanding of how other people see and then it tells me whether I'm conveying things I want to convey or not. Um, on this one you can see I've got a still image but you can see I've got a computer image. So sometimes when I paint, and when I was painting this one, sometimes I have still images and then I have my laptop and I've got the YouTube video up and I'll be on a certain second and then I've got my canvas. So I'm painting both from like video on screen as well as still images and then I can go back and forth. And one second in a video may show up as several seconds on your YouTube. At this point in time, I'm complying with YouTube copyright rules, which means I can't download it using the available software, uh, which is a limitation in the research. I look at Rosie to just say, yes, I'm being so compliant on it. Um, but, um, so it is a limitation. and. Actually, um, last night when I was preparing for this, I went in and it said video not available, and I was able to find it again. But a limitation is my um, original data sources can just disappear overnight. So um, I, the still grabs are helpful, but and there is methods to copy the video if I want. I just haven't done it because I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. That's good to say in front of the students, I guess, right? <laughs> always, always. <laughs> always. It's a challenge, and so it does make you think about what to copy and how to copy it. Um, this one, again, it just has multiple images, and I've fused them together with this one. I was also looking at a live, or a still of the, but with, on the computer as I was doing it. This is another one in the sequence. So I was, if you go back and look through then, I'm going, I'm looking, you can see big transitions with each one, right? These are significant transitions in terms of what that space was like. This is one from near the end. Uh, this is driving out of the fire. It resembles driving into the fire in some ways. This one's mostly finished, but not quite. So again, it's just a fusion of different images and putting it together. So then when I think about this, I need to, th as a move, I th have to think about how the viewer will experience it. And so what I want to do is have so the affordances of this technology are you can look in front of you and behind you, which you can't really do in real life. Like I can only see ahead of me and I can look in a rear view mirror, but I can't see both simultaneously. So the technology allows us to see, and I can play the two videos side by side and, and see what's happening behind and what's happening ahead simultaneously. What I can't see is what's happening on the side. So what I want to do for the dash cam display is have these displayed so the front would all be on one wall, and then the rear would be on the other, almost like in a hallway setting, so that you would go in, there would be an initial one, and you would have to go here, and then you have to turn to see the back view. And then you have to turn to see the front view, so that if you are, are looking at the paintings, you can't just look at it this way, in a linear way. You have to, how you move in that space. So that's part of that piece of painting as action, right? That I'm. Now trying to think about how people experience the paintings. So painting as form, part of what I've also now done is started to look at other painters that have been recommended to me. So Gerhard Richter is one. So I'm looking at painting people who paint from photos and people who paint from blur. So Gerhard Richter is someone who does work like this. Luke Toymans, the two pictures on his the left are actually his, from his 9-11. So I'm also looking at how other people paint disasters. So he's doing some indirect imagery uh, that relates to, he also did a still life as part of it, as a commentary on um, the 9-11. And then Monica Tapp, who's a Canadian painter and prof at a university in Eastern Canada, um, does paintings from videos. For her videos, she, paintings, she's using a handheld camera in a car. She takes three still images and pushes them together in, the, in there. So I had seen Monica Tapp's work and the difference between the small painting on the bottom and this one 
was I was starting to go into the video and go back and look at it, and inspired by Monica Tapp's work, look for still images. And one of the things is that this is a handheld. So this is panning with a, um, a handheld. And so part of the, the diptych piece of it is that it's much broader. So you can cover you know, a, a broader uh, range of imagery. But the quality, the nature and quality of the imagery is also different. And so that's when I started to come in. This will have some of the red in it eventually. But this is starting to now. And you can see some resemblance to Monica Tapp's work in what I'm doing. My fusion is not three videos of this or three seconds of video here. My fusion is, I don't know how many seconds of video across this space. And so it's somebody who's taking a picture of going into it, but then they pan, and then at one point they zoom. And so this is part of the zoom. And so what I'm trying to do is capture the feeling across a set period of time. And so now I'm starting to explore how to visually represent different types of technology. So the still images are of the dash cam where you're going, you know, you're watching and you're going through space and time. Now you're going through space, but you're visually scanning the space. So it will be different. And then there will be a, oh, not just some of my earlier work. So in addition to looking at, this is before I started to think about painting as a research method. So how do I integrate those other kinds of artists than with my own approach to painting? That's what I've been looking at. This will be the other piece with this series. It will be a larger painting. It will go on this side. And um, I'm really drawn to the beauty of these images. And this, it's harder to see with the lights on, but um, it's quite an abstract shape. And it really shows and captures the speed of movement of fire. And it's, uh, this reminds me a lot of the Monica Tapp work. So I really want to paint this piece, but it will be a larger piece um, off to the side of this. Because what happens is this guy is driving up and then turns. And you can see this space where there's just some trees. And these are the little sparks. And those are the sparks moving off into the space. Paint this image. Or the image that's on the slide, I, some of those for me are just like art pieces. I know it's part of this work, but for me, it's like I also just want to do it as a piece of art. So watching your house burn, the doorbell cam series. So the movement through space and time is different because it's a static view, but you see what happens over six minutes. And further, before they posted it, they edited it. I didn't notice it, that it was edited until I'd watched it a large number of times. Um, and so my idea for this was the notion of a flip book. So I could put the paintings, like the dash cam will be on the wall, and, the, and you have to turn and see them. But those people who were taking those images were moving through space as they did it. So in contrast, these images, the person's not moving through space. The image is static. So you can never really see that image those subsequent images at the same time. So I've got two options for it. One is a flip book, which would essentially be taking paintings, layering them together, having them on hinges so that you actually have to open it to go back through time. You would start with the last one and then go back to the first one. Um, so the first one is a photograph that I've digitally manipulated, I've printed. And I, what you don't see is the version where I've actually now painted on that. That's being scanned, and depending on how the scanning turns out, it will be printed on canvas. For this series, instead of painting on canvas, they will be printed on canvas, but I am doing digital photo manipulations. So these are, uh, I'm combining a number of images, again, to create my final image. And they will be, the image, the quality of the images already has a painterly look and effect, and so those will be printed um, onto canvases. These will be 24 by 36 in size. So 
again, these are all fusions of images that I am choosing. And again, it's based on what my sense is out of them. But I, there's also an aesthetic dimension to the composition and what I'm creating in it. So another option for the, the doorbell cam instead of, there are five in the, the doorbell cam, is instead of doing the hinged piece would be to have um, a five-sided structure so that each painting was on a different side and you would go around and like video you can keep going back and watching it again, right? But you couldn't see two paintings side by side. They look really nice side by side and I could do that, but it's part of that thing of if I want people to have this experience of it, then I want you to have to hold the image and go back and forth to move around and see it. So there's a few more paintings in this series. Um, the Watching Your House Burn, which I've already started on, which is a handheld outside view. Um, watching Your House Burn from inside, so a security cam. That's one where I paint on this, digitally reproduce it. And then I reproduce, I make three paintings of that. And then I paint over those images myself. And then Watching the Approach of the Fire will be a very large piece. And it's one where they um, handheld go around, go up, and zoom in. And so it, the canvas will be white, but the shape of the painting on the canvas will convey the space in which the imagery was taken, which will give you the feeling of that there's parts that you're not seeing and which parts you're seeing. But we don't actually see, we see video in this linear fa fashion, but what I want to do is show you what you've seen out of the video in one image. Um, so just coming back to my exploratory study, I'm still exploring, but as I've moved forward in here, I've kind of added to the dimensions that I'm focusing on. And so in addition to the phenomenological methods, I'm now exploring other artists and thinking about where this art sits. And so one of the spaces um, where my art would sit, originally I would have thought of it as landscape painting, but now I would classify it as contemporary history painting. So just reading from a document about history painting, it no longer elevates heroic events of the past to be viewed as a model for society. It now most often comments on photographic residue of world events. And so I'm in that genre of contemporary history painting is where I would situate myself as an artist and I'd situate myself in the crisis informatics field on the disaster and emergency management side. So I've got um, through the internal funding sources that I have. I had a research assistant this last year. We've looked at 11 wildfires and five floods from 2019, which were smaller events. Um, I have funding for next year, or this coming year, to look at uh, Australian and Californian wildfires. I'm quite interested in the Newfoundland snowstorm and then the COVID toilet paper <laughs> phenomenon. Um, my goal is to then move the paintings into a public gallery after showing them here at Royal Roads and then to do that focus group as part of the research there. Um, I want to explore other forms of reduction. At this point, my reduction is of an experience into a set of images. What I'm thinking about is reduction from across different people's experiences into a set of paintings. So the conferences I've gone to, in when people are producing graphic novels, they have found they can't take an individual story and write the graphic novel. They need to actually fuse the stories and create a new character that's a composite character. So there's tensions in that for me about what that would mean in terms of visual. So that's an intellectual space to go into. Um, I have been invited to go be an artist in residence for two weeks, either sometime this summer or fall, for the IISD Experimental Lakes. Um, uh, they're now having artists match up with their researchers, so I will work either on with a researcher or a research project and then do a set of paintings based on my work in that space. And then I'm looking at other artist residencies. The end.